I hope you're all doing very well. Today's mini training is going to be on how to treat your dog's separation anxiety. And I have to give the disclaimer at first that I am working between two different cameras at the moment. So if you see me shifting up and down, that's why. But I know that today's mini training is gonna be super productive for you. I'm going to walk you through the exact process that I teach in the Recovering Corporate Program that I have all my clients work through. Um, and I'm going to give you that step-by-step -step process today. Now, the technique that I use, I've created, and it's called Goal Oriented Goodbyes. It is based in desensitization, which is, so you can think of this as sort of exposure therapy. It's the process of exposing your dog to being left alone sub threshold, right? And what I've done is I've combined Melina Martini, who is sort of the god of originally using desensitization um, and that technique for dog separation anxiety, I have taken her method and I've taken uh, Julie Naismith's method and I've sort of combined them. Um, but I have also made a couple of tweaks that are unique to goal-oriented goodbyes. Um, and I know that it's going to help you actually feel like you are accomplishing something when it comes to separation anxiety. Um, so the first thing that you guys need to realize is that duration is not the end all be all thing when it comes to separation anxiety. Uh, in my personal opinion, and this is just an opinion, uh, I think that some of the other methods that recover dog separation anxiety are leaning too heavy into pushing time, pushing time, pushing time. We need longer. We need longer. We need longer. And I think that that makes sense for our train of thought. It's logical for us to interpret that, but that isn't necessarily what's required in order to treat separation anxiety. There are many other criteria that have nothing to do with duration that in my opinion are even more important. And so one of the things that I always say is that if you have a long duration of three minutes of leaving your dog alone, but that's assuming that you're not using any goodbye cues, your shoes aren't on, you're not locking the door, it's 7 a.m. and you know all the conditions are perfect, or you have a PR that is 55 seconds, but you do have your keys, you do have your shoes on, it is in the middle of the day, it's more practical. In my opinion, that 55 seconds is far more imp impressive than the three minutes without any of those goodbye cues. One is, in my opinion, significantly harder for your dog. And so I think that our brains naturally want to lean in towards the three minutes because it seems like a more successful number. But when you actually look at it practically, it's not realistic and it's not actually helping you get your life back, right? So that's the first thing I want you guys to debunk is that duration is not the end all be all solution to everything. The third thing that I want you guys to do is find your dog's threshold and you have to do this using several different experiments. But here's what I wanna be clear about. Sometimes people just walk out the front door and wait to see how long they can leave their dog alone. And the problem is, is that that's highly variable. Um, it there's, you could do one experiment at 7 AM and walk out the front door and your dog can handle being left alone for a lot longer than you would say the very next day at 2 PM. Right. So when you walk out that front door and you just wait to see how long Rover can last, there are a lot of variables that could affect that data to sort of affect the integrity of the data. Right. So you have to do several different experiments, but, and this is in my opinion, the most important part, you are finding out what you don't know. If you already know that locking the, dog, the door is going to cause your dog to go over threshold, you don't have to lock the door. If there is something in your mind that you already know is going to cause your dog to go over threshold, you don't need to run that experiment. The purpose of doing experiments is to find out what you don't know. It is meant to find out what you are unaware of when it comes to your dog's threshold. So if you already know that a certain criteria is going to cause your dog to go over the threshold, why are we doing that? We don't need to find, we don't need to do it to know, confirm what we already know. Instead, you should be thinking, okay, I already know that if I put on shoes and lock the door, that's going to cause my dog to go over the threshold. But what happens 
if I put on slippers and I don't lock the door? Or what happens if I grab my purse and my keys, but I don't actually lock it, right? So you are running experiments to find out what you don't know about your dog's threshold line. So find your dog's threshold. That's usually going to take several different experiments. And you are, the purpose of it is to make sure that you are finding that line between where your dog is somewhat kind of stressed and feeling a little bit uncomfortable versus in full panic where, oh my gosh, now, now she's completely over threshold and this is just a DEFCON 5 situation for your dog, right? Once you know where your dog's thresholds are, then you're going to start setting up your goodbyes, okay? And personally, I always have my clients plan about four to seven days at a time. And this is for a couple of reasons. One, because I want them to know what their big objective is. When are they trying to hit a PR? Why are they trying to hit a PR in that day? And what is that PR going to actually look like, right? What we don't want is arbitrary. What we don't want is we just walk outside and we wait to see, you know, at what point is Rover going to lose his mind? No, we are doing every single goodbye, every single mission with intent. And if a mission is particularly easy, that's intentional, right? If a mission is particularly challenging, that's intentional. So the only way to, to know all of that big picture is if you are trying to set out a rough draft and outline of that four to seven day mission plan. Now, you can totally change it mid-mission or mid-week, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. That comes a little bit later. But at least you need to have a, a general outline. And you need to say, I'm going to try to hit a PR on Thursday because I know that Thursday is, you know, I know that Wednesday is going to be uh, particularly busy in my life schedule. And Friday is when the trash guy comes and that makes Rover excitable. So Thursday is the ideal day to hit that PR, right? And when you're setting up your missions, you have a goal in mind. It is not that you are just walking out the front door and trying to build up time. And this is, I think, one of the things that differenti differentiates my method against um, Melina's or Julie's, which I love them. There's nothing wrong with that. But my method is a little bit different in that I want you guys to know what you're working towards. It's not just you were work, working towards walking at the front door. It's I'm working to get the mail. I'm working to uh, water my, my front lawn. I'm working to take a shower. Like if you can't even take a shower right now, there's certainly no reason for you to try to plan on getting the mail. There's no reason why you should be even worrying about your front door if you can't even take a shower right now without your dog going into a panic. If your dog, we had a lot of dogs that join the RP that it can't even go into the backyard by themselves and won't even go to the restroom unless their parents are watching them. So if that's you, if you can't even take your dog out to go to the restroom by yourself, there's certainly no reason why you should be messing with shoes and uh, keys and the front door at all. Why are you worried about that? That's irrelevant, right? Or if you always leave out your garage door. If you're, if whenever you leave the house, you go through the garage door, you don't go through the front door. Why are you worried about walking at the front door right now? You don't need to do that. <laughs> we need to be thinking about what is our objective and are we designing our missions according to that big objective? So let's say that your first objective is I want to be able to water my plants in the front yard without my dog having a panic inside. That's your objective. Well, then you need to be asking yourself, do I need sh shoes to be able to water my plants? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. That's subjective. Do I need to lock my front door? Probably not. Do I need my keys to water my plants? Probably not. Do I need to, um, have my purse or any of that shenanigans? Do I need to wear a certain type of clothes? Probably not, right? So we need to be thinking about if my objective is to water the plants, then I need to be designing my missions to look like I'm about to water my plants. And we need to only be incorporating the criteria that are going to get you to that goal of watering your plants. 
And we do this for a couple of reasons. Apart from the fact that it gives you actually intention with your mission, as opposed to just arbitrarily focusing on time. Apart from that, it aims to get you your life back. Because when you have a dog with separation anxiety, your life is heavily compromised. What you are available to do, what you are possible, or what is available to you to do is far more limited. And so in order to get you to get your life back, we need to be thinking about how can we start the baby steps now so that you can just water the plants every morning without your dog going into a hissy so that you can get the mail, right? So that you can take a shower. So we need to be thinking about what is actually getting you your life back and designing the goals and the missions around that. Okay. So that's, Step four is design your missions and make sure that whatever criteria you're implementing is with the intention of a, of an actual goal, apart from, I just want to, you know, leave my dog for four hours. Cause you could be sitting around for a very long time while you're trying to get your dog to four hours. Right now, the most important part though, is that in order to do the desensitization method correctly, you need to be returning to your dog before they have the opportunity to go over threshold and, or demonstrate undesired behavior. And the only way that you will know whether or not you're actually keeping your dog at a relatively minor stress level is if you are logging, you must be logging your, your behavior, uh, dog's behavior. And I know that this is the part that we all don't want to do because it's the, it's the homework element of it, but it is the way to actually be able to track your individual dog's behavior, because perhaps in your case, you know, in your dog's case, a yawn, isn't that concerning. Maybe a yawn is just a minor stress behavior. You won't know that unless you're tracking. Maybe, you know, pacing is a huge red flag for you. And that means that if your dog starts pacing, that he is building in, you know, in stress and he is approaching that threshold line, you won't know that unless you're tracking. So logging your dog's behavior is critical to actually getting a long-term result. Bar none, you must be tracking. Um, and at the end of the week, at the end of your mission plan, you want to look at it and you want to see how successful was my dog? Was this pretty easy or were these missions pretty challenging? Because here's the thing. Our goal is to have more overly easy, more success than anything else. So that definitely means that you are deliberately setting your dog up for some easy, easy missions on purpose because it gives you that history of being successful. And so when you go back and you review your week or so of training, you wanna actually be able to see how many of these were too, really easy for my dog, how many of these were challenging. And then you take that information to help you design the next week's worth of goodbyes, right? So a lot of it is about making sure that you are setting your dog up for success and that sometimes does mean that you are changing your mission plan midweek, right? Um, and sometimes it's, sometimes it has nothing to do with your goodbyes, as it sounds, but you find that your dog is experiencing more stress for something else in his life, and that is going to affect what your goodbyes look like moving forward for that week. That's relatively normal. So don't be afraid to shift your uh, criteria around and your expectations around for your mission plan. But you need it. You shouldn't be. It shouldn't be like every single day you're sitting down and writing a brand new mission goal, uh, because that seems that's for me, in my opinion, that's too broad, and it's not. It's not actually. You're not getting a cohesive approach. You're not looking at it holistically that way, right? It's too specific. So map out your goodbyes. Know what your intention is for the week. Know what you want to accomplish. Have more specific goals other than I just want to walk out my door so I can go, you know, to eat dinner. That's going to, you need more intention with your week to week uh, objectives. So hit like, if you got a whole lot out of this, tell me in the comments, what your takeaway was, what surprised you. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about the recovering rover program, feel free to DM me. Uh, and I'd love to chat with you guys about it. Have a great day.